Alex Carey, Democracy and Propaganda, the first popular challenge from the beginning till 1920. Between 1880 and 1920, the popular vote in the United States and the United Kingdom was extended from around 10 to 15 percent of the population to 40 or 50 percent. Leading researchers warned as early as 1909 of the likely consequences of this development. Popular election may work fairly well as long as those questions are not raised which cause the holders of wealth and power to make full use of their resources. But should wealth and power be challenged, there is so much skill to be bought and the art of using skill for the production of emotion and opinion has so advanced that the whole condition of political contests would be changed for the future. Four years later, in 1913, a committee of the U.S. Congress was established to investigate the mass dissemination of propaganda by the National Association of Manufacturers, hereafter called the NAM, the leading business organization of the time for the purpose of influencing legislation by influencing public opinion. The committee appears to have been no little awed by the apparent ambitions of the NAM for meeting the challenge to its interest from popular democracy by controlling public opinion. Its investigations revealed, the committee reported, that the aspirations of the NAM were so vast and far-reaching as to excite at once admiration and fear, admiration for the genius which conceived them and fear for the effects which the accomplishment of all these ambitions might have in a government such as ours. The committee's report coincided with the beginning of World War I, during which the Allied governments expended unprecedented resources on the development and dissemination of propaganda to create patriotism and hatred. Propaganda became a science and a profession. A campaign launched by President Wilson on America's entry into the war in 1917 filled every home, workplace, and leisure activity of the society with its messages. The campaign produced within six months so intense an anti-German hysteria as to permanently impress American business, and Adolf Hitler among others, with the potential of large-scale propaganda to control public opinion. Walter Lippmann, the eminent journalist, and Edward Bernays, a nephew of Sigmund Freud, served with Wilson's propaganda organization. Bernays led the transfer of wartime propaganda skills to businesses' peacetime problems of coping with democracy. When the war ended, Bernays later wrote, businesses realized that the great public could now be harnessed to their cause, as it had been harnessed during the war to the national cause, and the same methods would do the job. This wartime governmental propaganda organization, I might add, was called the U.S. Committee on Public Information and was the first propaganda institution in this country, and Edward Bernays was the only professional public relations man in this office. It seems ironic in retrospect that his uncle, Sigmund Freud, made major discoveries about the subconscious, while the nephew goes on to place these discoveries in the use of government and business. Bernays remembers that some media actually refused to accept his publicity stunts as news. There was at that time a certain integrity with some media who insisted that so-called manufactured events were not news and should not be reported. When the war ended, there was a confrontation between American business and labor. Business was determined to roll back the limited union gains made under wartime conditions. The confrontation culminated in the Great Steel Strike of 1919. The central issue of the strike was, in the words of Samuel Gompers, the right of wage owners to bargain collectively. At the outset, 
public opinion favored the strikers, who worked an 84-hour week under notoriously bad conditions. Five days after the strike began, the Steel Corporation launched a campaign of full-page advertisements which urged the strikers to return to work, denounce their leaders as trying to establish the red rule of anarchy and Bolshevism, the strike as un-American, and even suggested that the Huns had a hand in fomenting the strike. The strike was monitored by a remarkable body called the Interchurch World Movement, IWM, which was comprised of 26 Protestant churches. The IWM produced a two-volume report which concluded that the strike was defeated by the strike-breaking methods of the steel companies and their effective mobilization of public opinion against the strikers through the charges of radicalism, Bolshevism, and the closed shop, none of which were justified by the facts, and through the hostility of the press giving biased and colored news. Historian Robert Murray sums up the consequences. When the strike ended in January 1920, the men had gained not a single concession. Twenty lives had been sacrificed and $112 million lost in wages. Backed by a favorable public opinion which was based on an exaggerated fear of Bolshevism, this corporation proved that not even 350,000 strikers could prevail against it. The Secretary of Labor of the period, Louis Post, has described how, supported by corporate interest, the propaganda assault on public opinion was widened and extended until it produced an anti-red hysteria about an invented plan by workers and their leaders to overthrow the government. A McCarthyist period ensued from 1919 to 1921, more severe, though of shorter duration, than the McCarthy period after World War II. And here then, as final speaker on today's program, is Warren G. Harding delivering in 1920 a presidential campaign address titled Liberty Under the Law. It would be the blindness of folly to ignore the activities in our own country which are aimed to destroy our economic system and to commit us to the colossal tragedy which has both destroyed all freedom and made Russia impotent. He who threatens destruction of the government by force or flaunts his contempt for lawful authority ceases to be a loyal citizen and forfeits his right to the freedom of the republic. Meantime in Europe, where a similar progressive period was not cut off by a propaganda assault on public opinion, a different result ensued. Charles Forsay observes that after World War I in Great Britain and elsewhere, liberal parties gave way to labor or social democratic groups. In the United States, by contrast, politics moved in the opposite direction, and the socialists during the 20s virtually disappeared while liberals were reduced to an ineffective few. During the 1920s, American intellectuals reflecting on wartime and post-war experience, believe that democracy had reached a crisis. The manufacture of consent was supposed to have died out with the appearance of democracy. Walter Lippmann wrote in 1922, but it has not died out. It has, in fact, improved enormously in technique. Under the impact of propaganda, he concluded, it is no longer possible to believe in the original dogma of democracy, i.e., that it necessarily reflects the popular will in any significant way. Reviewing the experience of World War I, Harold Laswell, the leading American student of propaganda for the next 50 years, reached similar conclusions in 1927. With the decline of the authority of crown, church, and social class, and the rise of egalitarianism generally, propaganda had become the principal method of social control. If the mass will be free of chains of iron, it must accept chains of silver. If it will not love, honor, and obey, it must not expect to escape seduction. <laughs>